This podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today. Hello and welcome to Give and Tote Cannabis Conversations, the show that elevates the conversation about cannabis to a higher level. I'm your host, Paul, and today we welcome Travis Peterson, aka The Nomad Cook. Travis was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, and after a brief appearance on MasterChef Canada, he would leave the oil and gas industry to start The Nomad Cook, focusing on pop-up cannabis-infused dinners and in-home private dining. Since 2018, Travis has served thousands of people and is recognized as one of North America's premier cannabis chefs, one that is focused on helping to end the stigma associated with cannabis cooking. With his book Introduction to Culinary Cannabis, Nomadic Nights Dining Experiences, and his upcoming online masterclass, Travis is the curator of one-of-a-kind events while working towards creating an industry standard for technique, terminology, safety procedures, and accurate and responsible dosing. If you enjoyed today's show, please make sure that you're subscribed or following us on whatever platform you choose. And if you use Apple and Spotify, ratings and reviews really go a long way to promoting the show. It's also really helpful when you tell a friend. But for now, please enjoy my conversation with Travis Peterson, the Nomad Cook. Welcome to the show, Travis Peterson. Hello, thanks for having me. It's so nice to have you. Now, the TV show itself was a little too hectic for me, but my wife was a big fan and she watched a lot. I'm wondering how closely does the bear represent your experience in the kitchen? Oh, man. Um, it's it's funny because us chefs get asked that quite a bit, right? And um, it's anxiety just watching it because <laughs> it is it is a dead, dead-on conviction of what it's like, and especially being a pop-up chef where – my kitchen is constantly moving. I don't have all the tools, ingredients, if problems arise, and they always do. So to be a pop-up chef, you have to think quick on your feet. You have to be ready for problems. And that's almost any lead chef, you know? You're going to have fires. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely are too hectic for me, but I'm glad that you're surviving it. Yeah. So you're a former oil and gas worker, and I understand you basically took a severance package to kickstart your dream of becoming a chef. How did the Nomad Cook come to be? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, I always had a passion for cooking, but never once said I want to be a chef, right? I just love cooking for friends. I love food. I love sitting around a table. Um, I think that's the best experience you can have with people is breaking bread, sharing food and stories. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in the oil and gas industry for about 12 years. And 2015, I kind of jokingly applied for MasterChef and got picked to go on the show, Um I didn't do too well. I got eliminated on the second episode. So <laughs> I, I really left being like, well, that was a great experience. I had fun. You know, I walked off set with a big smile on my face. It was okay. Like, hey, back to reality. And 2015, we had a major recession in the oil and gas industry. And I got laid off three weeks after filming. So I was given a six month severance package that would allow me at 31 to dip my toes in the pool of becoming a chef because 31 is very old to come down this path, right? Most people start 16 in the dish pit, washing dishes, and you work your way up. So if I had not been laid off, I never would have pursued this. So that was literally the best thing that's ever happened in my life because, boy, did life take a right turn after that. That's really cool because I think sometimes you can be in the pit of life and things can look like, the, you know, everything's downhill from here. But, you know, you made something out of this opportunity where, yeah, gosh, shit, I'm laid off. This could be the end of things, but this has been the start of something for you. Yeah, you know, the job I had before, it was six figures. I played a lot of golf in the summer. You know, I was in a managerial position. So I kind of had what society said everyone wanted, but I was very unfulfilled in life. There was a lot missing. You know, I had this giant hole, nothing would fill it. Uh, becoming that first year of Nomad Cook, you know, taking an almost an 80% pay cut to start doing this, which was hard for the ego. But all of a sudden, that hole was starting to be fulfilled. I was happier. I was loving doing these events. I was, you know, the first year of the Nomad Life was really traveling between Alberta and British Columbia, two Western provinces in Canada. You know, I had three or four cities I would work in. I was really just kind of finding my way. 
And, you know, oddly enough, after two years of doing it, 2008, 2018 rolls around, I actually kind of said to myself, like, I'm glad I tried this, but if this doesn't really come together, I'm going to get out and go and get in the cannabis industry because 2018, Canada federally legalizes cannabis. And so I kind of said, okay, here we go, nine, 10 more months of this. And then I can say, at least I tried it. April 20th, 2018, I do my first cannabis pop-up. It was going to be a one-time thing. I turned my house into a pop-up restaurant and I have 164 people come through over a four-day period. So we were doing five seatings of 12 a day. CTV, which is the one of the national news channels in Canada, reaches out to me and says, hey, we heard you're doing a cannabis dinner. Would you talk about it on camera? And I said, sure, I'll talk about this illegal thing that I'm doing on a national <laughs> news station. Let's do it. They said, oh, we're only going to run it in the local uh, Victoria News. So don't worry. They come. It's a five minute piece. They also go to Health Canada for their opinion. And Health Canada's like, what he's doing is not legal. And uh, we're going to have to have a talk with him. And it airs at the uh, the regional Victoria News at 5. And then 5.30, they use it to lead the national news. And my phone explodes. Um, I get very nervous and scared. Like, I just made a mistake. So I very quickly take everything down offline. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't answer any phone calls. I have Health Canada calling me Friday 4 o'clock. Like, where is this event taking place? And I was like, I'll get back to you Monday. Yeah, wow. They really <laughs> stitched you up there. Oh, yeah, we're just running it locally and then it's national news. I, look, I, you know, having spent two years in Canada, I've, I really enjoyed my time there. And I wonder, you know, what was the response eventually? You know, they, they were a little bit annoyed at first, Health Canada. Yeah, Health Canada came and gave me a slap on the wrist. And, you know, I started getting emails from all over the country saying, hey, you should come do these dinners here. And I was like, okay, let's let's start doing it. And very quickly, I found my purpose. You know, I was reluctant to be called a cannabis chef at the very beginning. I didn't want to because I thought it was a fad. I thought, okay, we're legalizing cannabis. So everything's all cannabis so cool. But that first group um, of 160 people that came through, they were from all walks of life. I thought it was such a great representation of Canada because we had every culture, demographic, age coming in. And I was watching table after table become friends. Right. People who really would never talk to each other. All of a sudden, again, you sit them around a table, you've got good food and conversation and cannabis just brings that sharing component. So we were watching people become friends and I was loving it. I was just having a ball and I thought, OK, this is cool. Maybe I can get up and travel to Toronto and Montreal. And very quickly, within the first four months of doing this, served over a thousand people. I did all my advertising through social media, which I still do today. Um, but you've got to be smart on there. So it, uh, you know, it doesn't say cannabis dinner. It's an infused dinner. And uh, you kind of have to reach out to us to ask for more. So we leave the breadcrumb and, you know, the stoners follow the crumbs. <laughs> so, <laughs> But uh, the response was, it was overwhelming. All of a sudden I was like, I found what I was meant to do. And to sell out event after event after event was just, I mean, it's a drug in itself. It's just was awesome. And getting to travel all across the Canada, doing these dinners, I, you know, for me, it was amazing. It just it was something that wasn't planned, you know, through the whole culinary process. I just thought one day, I think I'll figure out where I'm supposed to take this. And uh, I would say like two months into cooking with cannabis, I was like, I'm a cannabis chef. This is what I'm going to champion. This is what I'm going to do. And here we are now. It's very cool. And I think it's interesting to kind of see the point in life that you took this on. Because I was reflecting just this week, like when my parents were at the age that I am now, their life was somewhat set in stone. They had a few kids, you know, they're onto their second house. Their life didn't change much from here. But I think, you know, while our generation has some things to deal with in terms of cost of living and stuff like that, we also have these opportunities that our parents didn't to just, you know, start again at age 31 to pivot when you feel like it. And it's really cool to see that you've put yourself out there like this because it's an incredible experience. You know, my biggest inspiration for doing this, you know, other than my father watching him time and time again, start new entrepreneurial businesses and make them successful with little to no experience in that field was, you know, some encouragement. But Anthony Bourdain, to me, he, he would be my... I guess, celebrity role model that I had never met before and kind of looked at. And like, this guy was a chef 
who wanted to be a writer, right? And struggled through addiction and loss and lived, you know, below the poverty line. And all of a sudden in his 40s, writes a little app op for the New York Times and it completely takes his life in, in a different direction. And for me to go, okay, listen, they're 31, like I said, very old to try and become a chef. It was kind of crazy, really. And I had a lot of people in that first year be like, you can't do this. The reason I'm the nomad cook and not the nomad chef was respect to the culinary industry, right? I had people be like, you're not a chef. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Fair enough. So fine. <laughs> well, hey, for, for, hey, listen, anyone, there are people who, you know, you go on to these reality shows and you come off and you can't really just give yourself that title. These people who are, you know, these chefs who spent 10 years working the line, understanding all the techniques, growing, you know, it, you know, when I came off Master Chef, I knew nothing. I was green. I got eliminated because I didn't put any salt on my pico de gallo because I never <laughs> seasoned food before, right? So um, watching him go for it, uh, for his dream, and it just was a big inspiration for me. And, you know, now to date, I've, you know, served over 15,000 people, their first infused dining experience. My reluctancy of thinking this was going to be something that young 20-year-olds enjoy doing really kind of bought into the stigma and propaganda of cannabis because my average age is 39. I'm 60% female and I've had almost 900 first time cannabis users. So that demographic of 55 plus who 10 years ago, this was an illegal drug, never touching it. It's bad, but now things have changed. Right. And smoking cannabis for someone who's maybe later on in their age in life, isn't really the best healthiest introduction. Whereas if we bring them into a nice dinner party that's familiar and comforting, edibles are a nice way to come into cannabis. Absolutely. Yeah. It was just such a magnificent experience for me to get to experience your cooking back in 2019. So my experience was linked to sundial products. So I got to have your ginger and turmeric uh, soup with lemon riot infusion, yeah. a crab stuffed prawn bisque type thing with zen berry infusion and a herb stuffed turkey infused with CBD. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, these, these are incredible. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't eat seafood. I don't often eat, you know, like I don't enjoy ginger that often. I loved every second of this. So uh, how do you go about designing a menu? Like that was obviously in partnership with a company, but how do you do that? Mo most times, like, you know, that's how I go about it is if we working with a brand. So brands will come to me and say, hey, we've got these strains. I'll go just as I'm shopping for any ingredient, right? I, I look at, you know, what's its flavor? What are the... For me, I think most people that are, you know, interested in THC percentage, that's probably like my third third thing on the list that I look at when I look for strains. The thing that really excites me with cannabis is the terpene profile, right? So what are terpenes? Terpenes aren't just the flavor and aroma of cannabis, but they're also responsible for the effects that we feel when we use it. So the cannabis industry has developed terms indica and sativa to really help sell cannabis. But those terms don't really mean what the industry is selling them as, right? The reason you're on the couch munching out on those indicas really is the terpenes within those profiles. And what's really cool is those same terpenes are found in plants, fruits, and herbs, right? So if you were to eat a mango 30 minutes before consuming your first joint, that mango will increase the effect. So the entourage effect, which that's what that's called, that's really what I'm aiming for when I'm creating a menu. I don't want to be using sedative terpenes at the beginning. I want to be saving those more for dessert, right? We want to use those uplifting terpenes like limonene and pinene that give us those citrus and herbal notes to really uplift our guests and get them excited and chatty. And um, so, you know, for me, it's, it's almost just like creating any other menu. What time of year is it? where am I cooking? What's in season? And we start matching that way. You know, for me, Sundial was the first cannabis company to give me any work in Canada. And they were so important for my growth and confidence because you, uh, do you remember when 2019? I wish I could have probably like October, November. Okay. So, you know, October, November, we go into 2020 and what happens come March, right? The whole world comes to a screeching halt and I lose all of my business in 36 hours. And I thought Nomad Cook is done, right? Like this is over. I have to refund. 
tens of thousands. It was just like anyone who had a small business, like, what are we going to do? I actually ended up eloping and marrying my wife through the pandemic. Uh, she was she was from the United or she is from the United States. And that, um, you know, Canada, I think, well, Australia shut everything down. So no one could get into Australia. But oh, Canada, yeah, it was a tough couple of years. <laughs> Canada went way over the top with the restrictions. We couldn't have more than six people indoors. What I ended up doing was that first summer of COVID, I got a sponsor to rent me a 40-foot RV. And we drove 8,000 kilometers across Canada. And we did 37 dinners outdoors in every province. So we went all through the Rockies, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, through the prairies. Fine, we're going to play by the rules. We're not allowed to do stuff inside. We'll do it outside, all 10 feet space and all the stuff, right? And it was so funny rolling into small towns in the Rocky Mountains and seeing people ride in on bicycles to our dinner that we set up along a river, right? Like, And these, everyone's in their 40s coming in on bicycles. And I'm like, this is amazing. As that summer came to an end and we started to realize oh, fuck, these lockdowns are coming back again. We decided to move to Arizona because Arizona had no mask mandate. They had no social distancing requirements. They really let life go on. And coming down here and seeing that, you know, this is where a lot of people come to retire. So it was an aged population down here. Nothing was falling apart. Everything was still working. And you know, we decided, okay, let's, let's move to the U S. So we took that, you know, we left Canada, we came down. And for me, it was, it was a little nerve wracking because I had really built my name in Canada. I really had my roots to go and tour. I was working with brands and to come down to the U S was like a fresh start, which, you know, starting from scratch, I'm now operating in 34 plus cities in the U S. So it was like, it was again, you know, getting laid off and, kind of being pushed into trying to do this as a chef was like the first best thing that could have happened to me. And then taking the chance of moving down to the U S it really just accelerated. We did the first year of nomad cook. We did 10 times our biggest year in Canada. It's just been remarkable since moving down here. Again, the goal was to get to Toronto, Montreal. Uh, all of a sudden now I'm cooking New York and Miami and Chicago and St. Louis, and the Midwest and going to places like Little Rock, Arkansas that I never thought I would ever visit in my life. So all of a sudden I got to travel around the U.S. I feel like I understand this country so much better now. I understand why people are so upset here. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, yeah, it only takes a, yeah, a few weeks on the road in the U.S. And, yeah. and whether it's people apologizing for the current president or explaining why, you know, yeah, all, all well, the things, <laughs> whichever I, side. I think what I'm seeing is, is really that the center of a lot of the country is falling apart and people feel left behind. And I think that's why they vote the way they do, because the system doesn't care about them. And I wish more Americans on the coast would go and visit the center of the country and start to talk with more of their fellow Americans, because I feel like the division that's being created here isn't really the division that's within the people not to get all political and stuff but um no, you know but I, I think cannabis helps heal that because i think so often all we have in common with another person is their cannabis consumption so everything else can be different their political leaning their upbringing their socioeconomic status but that cannabis can be the thing to join you together so i think you've got a good observation of that yeah and and that's what i've said about why i love these dinners because we sit strangers at a table and we don't ever have issues. The only time I've ever had a problem was in Las Vegas when I allowed alcohol. In yeah. And I had That's to, and I had to toss someone out, right? So I got a strict no alcohol policy. And sometimes people are like, oh, I want my wine with my dinner. And I'm like, well, great. Go to a wine pairing then. Because this is a cannabis dinner. And like weigh the two against each other. There's nothing better than getting that follow-up email the next day. And it's like, man, I don't have a hangover. I had so much fun. I remember everything I said. I didn't say anything stupid. Like... Um, you know, so it, uh, absolutely. There's this, this beautiful thing. I wish I could sit more people around the table and get them stoned off food because I think <laughs> we could solve some more problems that way. We're going to dig into kind of like the state of Canada and the state of the U S a little bit later in the show. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know your perspective on that. Uh, what I am really curious to know is, uh, how your body coped with the transition from the cold of Canada to the desert of the U S. <laughs> That's a good question because I, as you can see, it is sunny behind me. It is sunny 300 days a year here. Um, you being in Vancouver knows that it's 
Vancouver is the one part of Canada that it doesn't get a lot of snow, but it is rainy uh, for a good eight, eight months. So I I didn't like the sun every day. I had seasonal depression from too much sun. And, you know, <laughs> just I'm like, give me a little rain cloud so I can yeah. sit on this couch and not feel guilty yeah. about being outside. However, since tour, since I've my tour life really kicked off over a year and a half ago, you know, I spent about two weeks on the road of every month now. I love coming back to this. I love coming home, shorts, flip-flops. I, I get my taste of the ugly weather as I travel all around. And, uh, you know, so the, the transitions were made. My biggest fear is that I'm going to lose my thick layer of Canadian skin. <laughs> um, and, you know, I end up going back to Edmonton one February and it's minus 50 and I freeze to death. So I hope that doesn't come around. But uh, yeah, so, so yeah. far, so good. It's quite the transition. I like, I absolutely adore the Vancouver weather. I think there's something that kind of, it slows everyone down to my pace being that dark and that rainy or, or pretty much all year round. And then you get like six weeks of incredible summer where the sun comes up at 4 a.m. and goes down at what, 10 p.m. And you, you get out yeah. of the house for two months and then back into hibernation. So yeah, yeah. we've had, we've had three days of 30 degrees celsius here in melbourne so yeah i'm missing the cold right now yeah yeah i bet <laughs> so uh, you obviously mentioned nomadic nights this is a really exciting thing that you're doing all across the u.s so um you know talk to us about that and you know what can people expect and you know you've alluded to the clientele being a spread of people who are you meeting on yeah. these trips and we're meeting people from all walks of life there is really no standard person who comes in and i think what a lot of the cannabis brands love when they work with me is that my demographic of followers aren't all cannabis right i have a ton of chefs and culinary and foodies who probably use cannabis but that's not their primary focus so when brands come and work with me they get to kind of diversify um, the viewership of who's attending and so my cookbook came out at the end of 2022 and i wanted to get out and travel around so i made a little quick little tour around the u.s well quick little tour it was seven weeks but uh you know miami up to new york to chicago seattle san francisco las vegas phoenix so we did a whole circle around and that's when i first realized that okay you know what i could probably actually put this together and be a touring chef so Last year kicked off, and that's when I first introduced Nomadic Nights. We operate in states where it's recreationally legal, and I'll run an ad on Instagram. Again, those ads have to be vague because Instagram punishes cannabis industry. So all it says is uh, Nomadic Nights, five-course infused dining experience where we offer each guest individual dosing based on their own tolerance. Um, you have to ask me for the link. Uh, you can't just go Google and find it. So you know, we do safety protect a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's been really cool to see where this is really taking off. Um, again, the smaller size towns and cities in America, this is so popular. And Richmond, Virginia is a place that I can't not go back to. Every time I've left that Richmond, I've said, okay, that's probably it for Richmond. And I'm having a 50% rebooking of guests wanting to come back. So um, Kansas City, Missouri, St. Louis, uh, Little Rock, um, Nashville, these places in the center, again, that um, maybe you think are redneck. Uh, you know, the state of Missouri sold $1.4 billion in cannabis in its first year of recreational sales. So there is an appetite out there for this. I think there's only a handful of chefs doing it at the level I'm doing. So now, um, you know, I've been able to, I've taken on a young kid out of Kansas City. He's now working for me full time. I take him everywhere I go. And I've got some other chefs who've worked for me over the last couple of years who now host dinners for me. So we've got 420 coming up next month. I've got a total of six 420 events we're doing. Three of them I'm going to do where we go to St. Paul, Minnesota on the 17th of April. On the 18th, we do Kansas City. And then we're doing two in Seattle. But I've got three chefs in Canada who will be doing dinners on 420 under Nomadic Nights. We've got one in Edmonton, one in Calgary, and one in Kelowna. So my goal has always been to really open the door for the next generation of chefs so they can do this in a restaurant setting. I love what I get to do. It is a ton of work. and It's very hard. It's rewarding. But, you know, if I can leave this door open for those chefs to come through and do this at the next level, then, you know, 
I'll be quite happy with that. Well, yeah, you clearly have an investment in the industry and in the craft and, you know, it must be a big deal kind of handing over the reins to someone else, but I think it's also a natural progression. And I think that links really nicely to what you're about to do online with your masterclass. You know, yeah. you have this desire to teach people and educate people. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, I have over the last couple of months just been putting together an online masterclass for either the home cook or the inspiring chef. Um, it's introduction to culinary cannabis is titled the same as my cookbook. And it's really there to make sure you have the fundamentals to be confident when you're creating your extractions, confident when you're dosing a variety of different tolerances. You know, that's one thing that really separates me from the other cannabis chefs here is that each of our events, we dose everyone individually based on their own tolerance. Um, and I'm doing everything full spectrum. So uh, what's the difference for those guests might be wondering between full spectrum and isolates? We can isolate cannabinoids on their own, THC or CBD primarily. That's what you see a lot of the times in the vape pens. Um, pure THC by itself can be like a rocket ship of anxiety or paranoia yeah. to anyone with a low tolerance, right? Even me with a high tolerance, it still sends me crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. it really hits here in the head. When we're full spectrum, we're using uh, full flower. We are capturing not just the THC, but CBD, terpenes, because all of those work together to create a harmonious experience, right? The goal is not to get you super stoned at the dinner table. You may choose to do that, but I want to hit that perfect medium. Let's heighten your sensory. Let's heighten the taste, the smell, the conversation, everything that's going around. We want to put you in that perfect state. So very excited to get this up and out there. You know, I um, started a partnership with the Soho House. their global hotel group, a uh, member-based hotel group. Uh, we tour through their properties here in America. But last October, we went over to Europe and we did dinners in Amsterdam, London, Brighton, and Paris. And what I recognized going through all of these kitchens is every time I connected with the kitchen teams, people wanted to know how to do this. Where do I go? Because right now, there are some great cookbooks out there. Um, but I think the majority of them are focused on how high can I get off my brownie, right? What kind of sweet and over-the-top brownie dishes and Sundays, Real all those sweets food, and yeah. cookies and gummies. Yeah. And, and hey, I love them. Yeah, nothing great, wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, we are creating fine dining meals, multi-courses, you know, like you were alluding to a little bit earlier. So we want to put out the education so that the chefs can go out and be responsible with it. Uh, I very quickly am going to have this translated into other languages because, as I said, it was goal the goal originally let's get to toronto montreal and then we came down and all of a sudden now we're in new york and chicago and all of a sudden i'm cooking in paris like the wildest wildest path that i somehow stumbled across and, and gone down i mean had you told me 10 years ago you'd get to cook in paris in a five-star hotel one day for 100 people i would have said what are you smoking and <laughs> pass it to me um you know so uh, I feel like right now um, I have a platform. I have been recognized for doing this and to be first to market, to get some education out there that, um, you know, online doesn't matter if you're in a country where cannabis isn't illegal, you can go online and take this course. Uh, we're going to teach you about the fundamentals of cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. We're not going to get too over scientific, but we want to make sure you have an understanding of the plant, this ingredient, and what's happening inside your body when you're ingesting this, right? We want to make sure you understand the 10 most common terpenes, what their evaporation points are, how you can incorporate those into your recipes, as well as THC, CBD, CBC, CBN. All of these combined with terpenes can help create a different sort of therapeutic effect. The next section in the class we're going to look at is the safety responsibility and understanding accurate dosing, right? So there are a lot of things we do in kitchens right now already that very easily translate over to the safety with culinary cannabis, making sure we label all of the um, extractions we're making. So it's very clear what's in there. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, cross-contamination, you almost look at culinary cannabis as like an allergy, Right. Like if someone has a shellfish allergy, you go to specific steps to make sure that while you're preparing, there's no cross contamination issues. And, and you have to take that same consideration with culinary cannabis. Now, some chefs decide when they do these dinners, they do a blanket right across the board dosage, maybe 10 milligrams for everyone, 20 for everyone. 
taking our class, we're going to teach you how to make extractions that will help you dose everyone individually. You know, as a chef, you want to make sure your plate consistency is the same for every single person. So if you have a sauce that is infused, you can't put three scoops of sauce on one plate and a half a scoop on the other because when you put those plates down side by side, people are going to go, hey, I got two different dishes here, right? So what you have to do is you have to make that sauce four times. You've got to make it once with no cannabis, once with a low amount, once with a medium, once with a high, right? And you do that for every course. So I use a lot more flour than the average chef. And I have a lot more wastage at the end of the night. I can't travel with my extractions once they've been made. Um, you know, rules are still pretty strict here in the U.S. But uh, whoever is working for me doesn't seem to have a problem with that. <laughs> um, you know, it was quite funny watching the Soho House chefs divvy up my oil and butter at the end of every event. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. And, you know, once we've grasped the safety aspects and understand, you know, tolerance levels, responsible dosing, we're then going to teach you the extractions, right? So our traditional extraction method of decarboxylation, right? When we apply a source of heat to our flour before adding it to our fat, that's your traditional method. But I kind of teach in the book, you should really only use that method if you're working with a low grade of cannabis or if your goal is to maximize the THC potency. Because when you apply that much heat to the flour ahead of time, you're actually starting to damage the trichomes. Uh, you're heightening the chlorophyll on it. If you take a bite in that brownie or cookie and you taste the cannabis, it hasn't been cooked properly, right? So there's a method called the Sedano method where it's more of a passive decarb process where we add our flour directly into our fat and allow that decarb process to happen while it's heating. You know, it's less potent, but it's more terpene rich, it's flavorful, it's aromatic, it's kept its original color, it hasn't greened. You know, 70% of the time, that's the method I use to make my extractions. But we can also remove the cannabis flavor altogether. You know, you may be cooking for medical patients who need to take cannabis and don't like the any flavor in it. Well, there's a method to do that, as well as we can also infuse salts, sugars, and spices, right? So we can evaporate an alcohol tincture into our rock salt, right? But you have to keep in mind, just because you've infused the Cajun salt, you can't put that on a chicken breast and then barbecue it. What you want to do is use it as a finishing spice. So you've added a regular Cajun spice, you barbecue your chicken burger, you pull it off, and then you apply your cannabis spice to it. Or you have your cannabis finishing salts that you can apply on top of some raw fish to give it that beautiful little tang to it, right? So this course will give you those methods and you should come out of it going, okay, you know what? I feel confident now that I could serve a table of six who all have a different dosage and they would all leave with the same experience. Well, I hope all of Australia's crappy underground edibles makers are listening to this. Um, where will we be able to find the course and when will it be available? Uh, we'll be launching it around 4.20. Uh, you'll be able to find it. I mean, I've got my website, thenomadcook.com. The best way to follow me and everything I'm doing is Instagram. Uh, it's kind of the one social media platform I put everything through. I announce all my dinners and events on. You know, And I know uh, Australia is a little ways away from moving into the legalized space, but I am planning to come down. I have a lot of family down there. Uh, what was actually really cool in 2019 is one of your um, media stations, uh, Seven News. So they came up to Toronto and they did a five-minute feature on me. They actually sent uh, Pete Evans before he oh, before he off fell. The deep <laughs> <laughs> before he, uh, so this was 20, 2019, probably right before you came for your dinner. So yeah, right when everyone still respected him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's a great five-minute news article piece out there um that australia came the, they sent him it it was really cool because the whole angle was like listen canada is a cousin of australia right we share a lot of the same values we're a commonwealth country i was actually really surprised even though i lived in australia when i was 18 for a year i i didn't think it was so conservative and i was quite surprised to actually kind of learn that and um you know i might be wrong but someone told me that you know, Australia won't move until New Zealand moves. Because if New Zealand moves, then Australia goes, no, 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 wait a second, right? So Yeah, well, New Zealand really fucked that up for us because they had a referendum which was 50.5% no to 49.5% yes. And they they put the ch the fight back years. Because, you know, we're fighting for really simple things like exemptions for medical cannabis users while they're driving. Because right now, if you consume and drive, 
you lose your license for six months. We're, we're looking for the most basic things still. And yeah, we really were relying on New Zealand to get it right. And unfortunately, we're going to have to do it before them now. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the great thing is uh, even though Canada hasn't rolled this out perfectly, uh, there are a lot of things that have held back the growth of the industry. Like there is a huge difference between America and Canada when it comes to the cannabis industry. And the difference is capitalism. You know, there's a lot of safety procedures in that down here. But, you know, in California, they've got a dispensary like a Walmart. You can walk in and grab your basket and you go up and down the aisles and pick your products. It's not behind a counter. Here in Arizona, we have a cannabis hotel It's called the Claritin. You can order cannabis to your room. You can smoke poolside. We've got a dispensary here in Arizona where you can go in and get food. They, they have a kitchen in there and um, it is iceless being eye dropped on top. But I think there's nowhere else in the U.S. right now doing it. So, you know, these were things that were exciting to me when moving down here and realizing that uh, it's, it's moving a lot quicker here. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to. Uh, we've got 27 legal states for recreational. I think we're almost up to 40 medically like this, this train has left the station, right? So we've just seen Germany legalize. We have seen South Africa legalize. It's moving, right? So sooner or later, governments will recognize the tax money generated from cannabis that could be put back into the healthcare system. It could be put back into education, right? It could be put back into rehabilitation as opposed to this money going to organized crime. You lived in British Columbia for a little while, it was a $6 billion a year industry that went to organized crime, right? The Hells Angels ran the cannabis industry in Canada forever. All that money went in there. Now, all of a sudden, we're capturing this and we're putting it to use, right? No one overdoses off cannabis. No one smokes cannabis and goes home and creates domestic abuse, right? Oh, I shouldn't say no one, but, but you know, we don't see these same issues so well compared to things that are so common in society like you know sports gambling alcohol consumption you know illicit yeah. drug use you know there's a huge huge difference i think you know even driving a car is is technically more dangerous than consuming cannabis absolutely right and it's it is you know a constant uphill battle and and that's really what we use our dinners to do we change minds people come in with an expectation of what they think and then they leave with a new appreciation for what it can be. Well, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit more about legalization. Before we do, I'm hoping you might be up for a quick 60-second quiz. It is called Hotbox, where you will get a timer to answer would you rather questions. You all good with that? All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Best thing about working with cannabis? All the free weed I get. <laughs> Worst thing about working with cannabis? All the free weed I get. <laughs> Favorite terpene? Oof, uh, piney. Give up cheese forever or chocolate forever? Well, I mean, I don't like chocolate, uh, but I can't eat cheese because <laughs> it fucks me up. But I still eat cheese, so I'd give up chocolate. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Fuck yes. Flour or edibles? Well, flour, but I am currently trying to switch full-time to edibles. Like, I want to stop smoking, so. Yeah, very It's hard, I'm going to make them baby steps. Joints or blunts? Blunts. Canucks or coyotes? Really? <laughs> That's sacrilegious, isn't it? <laughs> Canucks, baby! <laughs> Favorite place to consume? Oh, man. Sometimes right here, you know, just coming home and just, just to kind of unwind and, and that, yeah. And lucky last, describe your perfect 420. My perfect 420. My perfect 420 was uh, 2018 when I decided to give this a shot in a let. 160 strangers into my home and told the news media about this illegal thing <laughs> I was going to do. I love it, man. I love it. So moving back to our conversation and tapping into your perspectives on legalization, you obviously explained that you do your nomadic night dinners in legal states. So that obviously is the biggest determining factor. But given what you've seen in all these places you've visited and worked in, where do you think is doing cannabis the best? And where do you operate with the most ease? Uh, my busiest and best market is Washington, Seattle, Washington. Um, everything we do sells out there. We go there every two months. I put my largest events on there. Uh, the Midwest is having a lot of success. It's hard to say where it's doing it right because I think every market is doing it somewhat a little different. I mean, California is somewhat the most advanced. They have the best cannabis products in the world, in my opinion, from beverages and that. But the tax... 
they're, ta- they're taxing 30, 35 percent. So that's that drives everyone into the black market, right? Um, I look at what's being done here in Arizona with the cannabis hotel and the dispensaries having kitchens because it's the wild west out here and there's not a lot of enforcement with this regulation. So uh, the capital for weed in the world right now is New York. There are food trucks that are dispensaries selling weed on the side of the road. Every single bodega and corner store is selling weed. And that's all the illegal stuff. They cannot, they can't control. It is everywhere. It is, it's crazy. It's crazy. And what I found was really cool is when I went to Amsterdam in October to do my dinners and I was in the, uh, there's, you know, the coffee shops and stuff. They're selling American wheat. They're importing American wheat, and they're selling it at <laughs> jacked up prices, right? Oh, it's, it's like 55 euros for a gram sometimes. Oh, it's yeah. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I think um, uh, what's going to be great for a country like Australia is when they decide to move into the space, they have an opportunity to really look at these other countries and determine what was done right, what was done wrong, and, and hopefully don't make the same mistakes. Canada still has a 10 milligram per limit edible right and it's ludicrous it just it doesn't make any sense so we're hoping come 2025 there's a change of government in canada and some new perspective comes in that listens more to the citizens of the country than his own ego and um yeah. Well, yeah, I just had the executive director from Normal Canada on the show a few weeks ago, and, you know, she's leading the charge for the petition to change the edible limit. And much like us with our medical cannabis driving laws here, sometimes you just like, you look at these fights and you're like, I would love to be doing something a little bit more significant than putting all this effort into something that seems like a pretty logical change. Like a 10 milligram edible yeah. limit is fantastic. Even for me as a high tolerance consumer, yeah. I love 10 milligrams. That's perfect for me, but that is not perfect for every consumer. And what are they doing? They're not going, oh, I'm not going to have edibles. They're going back to the underground. No, absolutely. But then again, this is a new industry. If they move too fast and things go bad, then it just reconfirms people's previous stigmas and and propaganda statements. So it's always easier to pull pieces of red tape away than stick all the thing, all your fingers in the holes of the dam. Um, You know, the slow movement of legalization actually works in my benefit because I can't be everywhere at once. So the fact that there's 27 states right now, that means there's still 23 left when they convert over, right? So a little by little, it's moving in the right direction. And, you know, we've got a big political year here in the U.S., which will we'll see what happens afterwards, right? Yep. I mean, you've alluded to the challenges that Canada have. I got to experience some of them firsthand, you know, consumer frustrations, frustrations with licensing costs, all these different things. Like I assume a big part of your move to the US is not just the pandemic, but also the opportunities. So, you know, Canada, there is a lot to celebrate and be optimistic about. You know, once the edible limit is kind of taken care of, what other things would you like to see Canada kind of improve and get right? You know, I I feel like some of my opinions might be biased, but the one thing down here, you know, in Canada, there's no unique packaging allowed, right? Everything is in a plastic case with a generic color to it. Not similar to what they did. See, Canada tied the Cannabis Act to the Tobacco Act, which was a huge mistake in my opinion. Um, they're two separate things. Because I do agree with what we've done with cigarettes, where you can't even see them when you go into a store. All the boxes are green. But I really like in, in America, we see the branding. There is some really cool branding that goes on down here. You know, cannabis companies down here can give away cannabis. And that's what a lot of them want to do, right? In Canada, they don't have that same freedom to just gift and give away. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of regulation in Canada, but that is the Canadian way, right? Let's, <laughs> let's make sure let's everyone's cautious, safe yeah. and protected. <laughs> yeah, cautious and uh I, I hope for change. I want culinary cannabis to be a Canadian cuisine. I want people to come to Canada and get to experience cannabis. You know, one day I'll move back. We're down here for opportunity. And being down here, I really, it's funny. I, I really drank the Kool-Aid on freedom. First yeah. of all, I always <laughs> thought that was ridiculous. And I I want my freedom, right? And like I got, I got that when I first moved here and all of a sudden I was allowed to do work, right? And if you work hard down here, there are, tremendous amount of opportunity right so i'm killing myself touring i'm on the road two weeks of every month did 137,000 miles last year of flying it's a lot but um i know it's all going to pay off and it's 
it's um it's worth it life on the road is often painted as pretty rock and roll has that been your experience of it people it's funny people are like oh that's so awesome and, and i bet if you ask any comedian or musician every city is just another hotel room <laughs> yeah, you know yeah for me i'm turning 40 in a couple months i just don't have the energy after events so you know i was just i just did nashville and chicago and my whole experiencing of a city is going to get lunch right i'm gonna scout out where's the best hole in the wall i'm in nashville i want to go eat some nashville hot chicken i go to chicago hey where's the chicago dog where's that chicago deep dish pizza where can i go get these bites of food that i can't get where i live and for me that's how i get to really remember cities by yeah i'm loving those videos on instagram as well the hole in the wall it just makes me very hungry and sad that i'm sixteen thousand kilometers away but I'll, I'll be back i'll be back i'm curious as we head towards the end of the show is there somewhere that you're really looking forward to working in you know somewhere that's not a legal state yet or it's only medical and you're just waiting because you know you're really excited about the opportunities there yeah well uh i'm actually in a couple of months going to be moving to austin texas uh texas doesn't have legal cannabis uh but austin is one of the biggest booming cities in america right now it has the highest population of millennials that have moved there you know we saw a big exodus out of california to austin during the pandemic uh i work again the soho house uh there's a soho house in austin miami nashville so uh, we do do private dinners for them in there. My plan in Austin is I'll start a supper club that doesn't have cannabis just to be able to connect with people to let them know that I'm here. And when Texas turns, that'll be cool. Uh, I'm working right now with a retreat group out of Holland to put together a African safari in South Africa for next February. So right now it's kind of just up in the air of we're throwing stuff around. But if this comes to fruition, I mean cooking in South Africa with weed, that would just be the biggest trip, man. Hell yeah. It would be pretty surreal. And then, uh, man, I'm coming to Australia. Like, this will be coming. We will be doing dinners there, and you won't have to wait long. Um, Hell yeah. I've got a lot of connections down there, so we won't be publicly saying, hey, we're doing a dinner, but... <laughs> I'll be posting the recap video, you know? <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, that's so exciting, man. These are the things we need because honestly, you know, working in Canada for two years, I loved sharing my experiences. I worked in a beautiful store. We had amazing products. You know, the quality got better over the two years I was there. But one of the big things that I often leaned on was that dining experience with you, you know, to tell people that a former MasterChef contestant, you know, because MasterChef's a bit of a, an institution here as well, you know, that yeah. you were doing these infused dining experiences really gave an air of legitimacy. So I would love to see that down here you know in whatever circumstances that's really exciting hey i, I when i come there's a seat for you my man don't man, worry about that i'd so. absolutely love that thank you well at this point as we approach the end of the show i usually do a segment called paul's of wisdom where we leave the listener with one key takeaway dinner party fact or a call to action now i'm wondering if i could maybe put you on the spot could you be so kind to leave us with like the simplest cannabis infusion recipe someone could do at home absolutely so what you're going to want to do is if you have an eighth of cannabis flour, right? So that's three and a half grams, uh, which equals out to 3,500 milligrams. Okay. Um, let's just say uh, most cannabis strains are between 20, 22% THC. So let's just say we're working with 22% THC. So you have an eighth of that. You have one cup of olive oil. Okay. So that's 250 milliliters. Chop your flour up, put it to use a mason jar, put your flour in there. Now you're going to want to use, it's really important to use the right equipment. So if you have a sous vide or a water circulator, that's the best piece of equipment to make your extractions because you can control the complete time, temperature, environment that you're making your extractions in. I would go at 175 Fahrenheit. Forgive me, I don't know the Celsius <laughs> off the top of my head, but 175 Fahrenheit and go for two and a half hours, pull that out, strain it through. Okay. To understand what your milligram per milliliter is, what you're going to do, and I'm going to do it on my calculator as we go. And this is all stuff we'll teach in the class. So we are 22% THC. We are going to multiply that by our 3,500 milligrams, which gives us 770 milligrams of THC. Okay. Now, the Sedanial method, we're going to lose about 35% of that. Okay. So we're going to subtract 35% which gives us 269.5 milligrams. We will divide that by our 250 milliliters of olive oil. 269.5 divided by 250 
will give us 0.92 milligrams per milliliter. So you almost have one milligram per one milliliter. Anytime you're going to make an infused oil, make it as strong dosed as you can with the highest level of THC because you can always concentrate that down. If you only want to put 25 milligrams of THC, but the recipe is calling for more olive oil, just take that same olive oil that doesn't have the cannabis in it and then add in your infused olive oil and multiply that together, right? So if you make something really strong, you can always concentrate it down. Very, very cool. It's exciting times, man. And people will find more of this information on your course and in your introduction to culinary cannabis book, which is really exciting. Travis, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you today. Where can our listeners get in touch? Um, the nomadcook.com, but I think the best channel, if you want everything up to date with what we're doing, uh, Instagram, the underscore nomad cook. We've got nomadic nights happening all across America and North America, rather, America and Canada. Yeah. We've got the book Introduction to Culinary Cannabis available on Amazon. We've got online masterclasses coming soon. Travis, thank you so much for your knowledge and your time. Yeah. Thank you. Given to Cannabis Conversations is written and produced by me, Paul. Music written and produced by Big Mike. Follow us on Instagram at Give and Toke or get in touch by emailing giveandtoke at gmail.com. All opinions expressed by program guests are solely their current opinions and do not necessarily reflect the position of Give and Toke. Content discussed in this show does not constitute medical advice. Cannabis is not legal everywhere, so please be aware of local laws. 